Thanks, Justin, for the reading. It's a great passage, isn't it? I do much better in the Old Testament than Isaiah 53. It really points to this coming of a person because it's all about Christ. Turn with me page four on the, uh, uh, your booklet where there's an outline, page four and five, of what I'm going to be going through in this next half hour. And we'll work very quickly through a series of material. Familiar with many of you, but that's the purpose of having it, really. More of that in a moment. See, one of the sad things about Australia today is Christmas. Because what we have today is Christless and crossless Christmas. And that's not really Christianity at all. It's the Christianity of this land which is false and phony in its ways. It's a kind of cultural Christianity, and you see it especially at Christmas time, where you get Rudolph and the Red Rose Razier, and you get uh, Hark the Herald Angels played simultaneously in the same shop, as if it's talking about the same kind of thing. It's the cultural Christianity that promises presents for good children and no presents for naughty children. I've never met a child naughty enough that didn't get the presents, but it's the way it is, given by some imaginary, inappropriately dressed, uh, obese, bearded character who falls down chimneys that we no longer have in modern houses and dressed for anything but an Australian summer. It, it's a Christianity without Christ, and a Christ without the cross. And so it's not genuine Christianity at all, I wanted to tell you. It's not genuine. For Christianity is not like any other religion or philosophy. Christianity centres upon a person. And it's not just a person. It's a person who was crucified. Other religions, other philosophies have rules and regulations and special buildings as this is a kind of special building and, and they have morality and modes of living and they have key people, prophets, leaders, teachers, modelling life, but Christianity is Christ. Buddhism, Hinduism, even Islam would be exactly the same whether their founder lived or didn't live. But without Christ... Christianity is false, for it's all about him. It's about him and his claims and his actions, his life, his death, and of course, especially his resurrection and his rule over the world today and his return to judge us. It's all about him. You can have Islam really without Muhammad and you can have Buddhism without Buddha, but you can't have Christianity without Christ. Without Christ and without the cross, we don't have Christianity, not genuine Christianity, that's not what we have. We don't have the powerful, life-transforming, society-making, world-changing Christianity that you can see in history and you can see in the person of Jesus in the New Testament. So, about 45 years ago, I created a little presentation of the gospel called Two Ways to Live. I worked as a university chaplain for 30 or so years and after a little while it became clear that we just needed to simplify it with some diagrams for the engineers. It was a little difficult to manage it because uh, I had to teach the arts people to learn things off by heart, which was even more difficult. But between them, I, we came up with this little presentation called Two Ways to Live, which can be used to introduce genuine Christianity to non-Christians and to help people know how to share their faith with their friends and to help Christians understand the logic of the gospel, how it all fits together and why Jesus is so important and why him being crucified is so important. And so we came to Two Ways to Live. Now, many of you, I no doubt, have seen it. Um, I looked down the list of who's here, and I, I recognised your parents' names all over the place. So I know there's lots of you who I know and who I taught Two Ways to Live a generation. I haven't seen any grandchildren coming yet, 
But if I hang around long enough, there's a chance, isn't there? But I certainly have seen the choice. And so many of you have learned it, taught it at church, taught it at camp, even taught it at school, depending on the school you went to. But I thought we should need to go through it right now so that we have a basis. It's the basic building block for everything. For our fellowship together, because not everybody here has seen it before, and so it gets everybody there on the same basis, but so as to help you understand from the very author himself what this booklet, what this presentation of Two Ways to Live is about. And so we all start on the same basis together with this. Uh, you'll notice, those of you who have learnt it already, that this is a new edition I'm going to be giving you. Uh, same truths, but slightly different wording and slightly different Bible verses we're going to use as well. In fact, today I am revealing, really for the first time, the new edition of Two Ways to Live. We, we've been working at it for some time, but this is the world's premiere of the third edition of Two Ways to Live. We've discovered that there's five ways to, no, there's only two ways to live. It's just a, a tweaking of it, but it takes us 20 years to tweak it. Okay, here goes. There are six concepts. I've actually dealt with point one, points two, and through to point seven gives you the six. Six concepts we deal with uh, in genuine Christianity. The first one is creation. That is that God created the whole world out of nothing. He is the creator. We are part of that creation. We are his creatures, but he's made a special place for us, a special role of being in his image, like him. We rule the world, and we are to rule the world like him. It's, he is the ruler of the world, and he's made us to rule the world, but he's made us to rule the world like him. And so, we're to the rule the world his way, not our way. This tells us about God and who he is. Even in a sense of what God is, he's a creator. And who and what we are and what purpose we have in life. So here are the propositions we have in two ways to live. Firstly, God is the ruler of the world. That's who we're talking about. Secondly, he made the world. And thirdly, he made the world... He made us to rule his good world, giving thanks and honour to him. You see it in our, our little picture, our little image. The crown representing God as the ruler of the world, the circle representing the world, and the little man uh, standing there under the authority of the crown over the world. And so a Bible verse that picks it up is, Rome, is Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, uh, you are worthy, we turn to that one, can we, on the overhead? I don't know where we're up to, but Revelation 4.11 should come up somewhere. Now, yes, no. Who knows this verse off by heart? Hands up. Uh, not enough of you, yes. I am waiting for it to appear. In the meantime, I'll read it to you. I don't know how anything ever appears. Ah, there we go. Why don't we all read it together? We're not allowed to sing together, but there's nothing about reading the Bible together. So behind your masks, why don't we read it together? You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Notice the reason for which God is worthy to receive glory, honour and power. The reason is because he's created everything. That's the reason. This is the fundamental to the Christian and Western view of the life. The Bible's teaching of creation is the basis of science, as well as morality, as well as meaning, as well as language. There's so much to teach you about all this, but I'm not going to. But I just want to warn you, don't get sidetracked to think that the opposite to creation is evolution. No, no, the opposite to creation is accidentalism. Either God has made it or it's just happened. They're the two alternatives. And if the world, including you and me, just happened, if we're just an accident, then you need to understand the consequence of that. Because lots of atheists like that idea, get rid of God, it's just an accident, 
but they hardly ever are willing to abide by the consequence of that accident. Because if it's all just an accident, then there's no meaning in life. There's no purpose to life. There's no, if there's no meaning and purpose to life, there's no morality in life. There's no such thing as right. There's no such thing as wrong. There's no such thing as justice. There's no such thing as evil. Accidents don't have evil. Accidents are accidents. They're just happenings. We're just a, a happening. And life is totally meaningless. Here's the great atheist of the 20th century, uh, and he's still alive, Professor Richard Dawkins. See how he says it? The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect, that if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. That is atheistic understanding of the world. That is accidentalism. That's the alternative to the creator. Rarely ever expressed. Very few. Your, your atheistic friends will never actually think like that. That's why you need to actually show them, here is your atheist leader. Look what he says about your life. You are absolutely meaningless. And your morality is stupidity. Because there is no such thing as justice or love or even truth. The Bible presents us the world as God has created it, but, but that's not how we see the world now, with this balance of the good creation, which leads us to the second concept, sin. That is, as we say it in our book, we all reject God as our ruler by running our own lives our own way. But by rebelling against God's way, we damage ourselves. We damage each other. We damage the world. Now, this is picked up in our Old Testament reading that we had with that verse that uh, I won't get you to read out loud because our, our dear friend has sung a song in such a fashion that you'll start bar at me, won't you? So notice the verse that's there in Isaiah 53, verse 6. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way. Notice, this is what we call sin, but we don't use the word sin because people are confused by the word. They think the word sin means rules and regulations, or especially rules and regulations about sex. That's not what the world means. The word sin means going our own way. Not God's way. We were created to live God's way, but we choose to go our own way. And so most people confuse sin with sins. Sins are the symptom of the disease called sin. Symptoms are important because they're the thing that gets you to the doctor. Because it hurts, I go to the doctor. That's why you go to the dentist. My tooth hurts, so I go and see the dentist. When I get there, they tell me what the disease is that is causing the sin. So most people concentrate on the sins and don't understand sin. Sin is going your own way. But when you go your own way, you damage yourself. You damage others. We damage the world the ecological disasters we see all around about us. It's important to address the symptoms, but much more important to cure the disease. A Band-Aid on cancer may be necessary, but doesn't help. You've got to do something much more fundamental, haven't you? Sin is Adam's choice to know good and evil without God. Not so much to break the law, as to make the law for himself. I make up the rules for myself. It's my life to do with I please. It, this is so much more profound than simply just breaking rules and regulations. It's placing ourselves outside the law of God. And when you place yourself outside the law, do you know what you become? An outlaw. That's what the word means, isn't it? And everything you do, good or bad, is in rebellion against God. And it's much more universal than people realise. You see, some people say, well, I'm pretty good. I don't, I don't do this. I don't steal. I pay my taxes. They don't understand that they're outlaws. They're living in opposition to God. 
There's a word for it, autonomy, but most people don't know what the word autonomy means. But I read an article by a non-Christian in the newspaper this last weekend, Saturday, uh, about control. And she was writing saying, why don't we like the pandemic? Because the pandemic challenges our control. We can't do what we want, when we want, how we want. We can't go where we want to go. We've got to wear masks in buildings. We've got to stay distant from people. Sometimes we're locked down in our places altogether. We lose our control. And what we want is to go back to life before the pandemic when we were in control of our lives. We want to have control again. She was writing about sin, but she didn't know it. Well, what will God do about our rebellion? Brings us to the third key concept, judgment. God won't let us rebel against him forever. God's punishment for rebellion is death and judgment. Uh, The Bible verse that's there, yeah, we will read this one together because you're not going to start singing. The Bible verse there is from Hebrews 9.27. Ready together? People are destined to die once and after that, to face judgment. It's not just death, it's what happens after death as well. Now naturally this concept nobody likes. Uh, Christians don't enjoy mentioning it, non-Christians hate it, they reject it as hate speech and make fun of it. In fact God doesn't like it either because he doesn't reject, he doesn't rejoice in the death of a sinner. But without judgment there's no meaning or morality. If all of life is only stumbling forward in the crematorium queue, waiting to get our chance to go up the chimney, then it doesn't matter what we do, does it? The massacring of millions or the feeding of millions? Doesn't matter, not to Mr Dawkins, because we were an accident at the beginning and there's no judgment at the end. So whether I feed you or kill you, Six or one, half a dozen the other. Which day of the week it is? Monday? Uh, no, Monday, I'm not sure what I do on a Monday. He said, it doesn't matter what I do. Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot, all the monsters of the 20th century that killed millions and millions of people did so out of this kind of godlessness. But if we all have gone astray, each of us is turning to our own way, well, then we are in trouble when it comes to death and judgment. But, next one, because of his love, next thing, because of his love, God sent his son into the world, the man Jesus Christ. Jesus always lived under God's rule, but Jesus took our punishment by dying in our place. We call this the atonement. Here is the centre of Christianity. This is what Christianity is all about. This is what God's love is all about. It's all about Christ and what he did when he came into the world to save sinners by dying for us. The little word for is a key word. He dies for us as our representative and as our substitute. See, when someone goes and plays cricket, football, basketball, whatever it is, wearing the national clothes, he represents us. That's why we cheer when we win. That's why we're sorry when we lose. That's why we're deeply embarrassed when we cheat, because they are paying for us. But sometimes in the middle of the game, depending which game it is, they they'd send one off the court or off the field and bring another one on as a substitute. A representative is one thing, a substitute is another thing. Jesus dies as our representative, the one man for all of humanity, but he also dies as our substitute. He takes my punishment upon himself. Come back to Isaiah 53, verse 6, and see what it says. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, without creation, sin makes no sense. Without sin, judgment makes no sense. 
Without the judgment, the cross makes no sense. How does one Jewish bloke getting crucified 2,000 years ago make any difference to you and me? But when you understand that that man 2,000 years ago died taking my sin upon himself, turning aside God's judgment against me by taking God's judgment for me, then suddenly that's not just a bloke dying 2,000 years ago. That's a person who is dying in my place as my saviour, as my... There's... But the cross is not the end of the story, remember. He didn't stay dead because he paid for the sins of the world. And so the sixth of our thing, the fifth of our points, isn't it? The resurrection goes like this. God raised Jesus to life again as the ruler and judge of the world. Jesus has conquered death, now brings forgiveness and new life and will return again in glory. Notice the past has Notice the present, now. Notice the future, will. Notice, first of all, the astonishing event of history. Jesus didn't stay dead, but rose again. And we can look at the evidences of history. One of the books you can look at to see it is a man called Pincus Lapide, uh, a Jewish writer uh, of the late 20th century. He remained a Jew, but he looked at the historical evidences for the resurrection of Jesus and was convinced that Jesus rose from the dead. He didn't become a Christian because he didn't understand his Bible, but he did understand his history. So here you've got a Jewish non-Christian writing, looking at the historical evidences of Jesus' resurrection and saying the only real conclusion is that Jesus rose from the dead. But secondly, notice in rising from the dead, Jesus became not a dead man walking around, but he became the ruler and judge of the world. For by his death... He conquered sin and death. By his death, sorry, he conquered sin. By his resurrection, he conquered death. So thirdly, notice that his death and resurrection changes our present. Forgiveness and new life is available now and changes our future. He will return in glory. A verse that picks it all up is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. 1 Peter verse 1, verse 3. Again, let's read again out loud. I know against the mask it's difficult, but try it with me. Ready? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Everything is now changed. We now live with a man who in charge of the world. Because Jesus doesn't stop being a man, but we now have a man in the Godhead ruling the world. And our future is not simply death and judgment. Our future now is picked up into hope because we have forgiveness of sins. The very sin that was leading us to death and judgment. Well, where does that leave us? It leaves us with two ways to live in this lifetime. For now we see the importance of our sixth piece, point seven on your outline, repentance and faith. For there are only two ways to live, really. We either live our way or we live God's new way. Our way, the normal human way of people living, is to reject God as ruler. by by living our own way. Uh, Many people don't reject God. They say, oh, I believe in God. I just choose to do what I like to do. You know, I believe in God, but, you know, he doesn't talk to me, so I make up my own rules. Oh, yes, I believe in God. We we sing carols at Christmas time. Oh, yes, I believe in God. I don't know his name. Loads of people believe in God. The majority of Australians believe in God, but they reject God as ruler because they don't have God as God. They have themselves as God. We run our own life our own way. And if God says something that we don't like, well, I'll do what I want to do. Of course, when we live that way, we are damaged by our rebellion. For God's way of living is the best way to live. And worse still, 
we face death and judgment. For in death we come face to face with the God that we have rejected. The second way of living is God's new way because it involves Jesus. You see, we now submit to Jesus as our ruler and rely upon Jesus' death and resurrection. Because he's my saviour, I trust him. Because he's my ruler, I submit to him. And if I submit to him and trust him, then I will be forgiven by God and given new and eternal life. Uh, the Bible puts it this way in John 3, 36. Yeah, we could read it together, couldn't we? Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. It's very clear. Jesus' teaching was very, very clear. It's either this or it's that. There in the end are only two ways. One that leads through death into the judgment. The other that leads through Jesus taking the judgment into his resurrection life. You're going to hit the adult world now. <laughs> You've hit it already, but now it's really opening up in front of you. More of that tomorrow and the like. But it, as you go to university, you're going to meet people. People, people, people. I mean, you did at school, didn't you? But at school, you kept meeting the same people. Now, you keep meeting different people. You know, the first tutorial class I remember going to, I met those people and, and I, I was with them in that little group of 20 people for the year. But the class that I was actually in was 800 people. Every time I sat down at a lecture theatre, I was sitting next to different people. I was constantly meeting new people and have been since 1963, just meeting more and more. But the, hey, universities are lots of people gathered together on a little place. Hopefully, and I do hope it for you, that you'll get past COVID and be able to get back onto campuses. Right? I, really, I really feel sorry for you in the hitting university, in the distance learning of, of our COVID Zooming world. It's a, as soon as you can get back, do get back. Because it's a different thing meeting people that way than meeting people Zoom way. And I think you guys are people that a lot of us feel a special concern, uh, sorry, um, that you had to go through the HSC uh, or the equivalents as you did through last year and think you're terrific that you survived it. Right? Because frankly, that was, you will always be remembered as you will always remember <laughs> that you were the class that had to do it that way. Marks you out as very, very special in the history of our kind of community and I hope it's over soon by the end of this year I trust it will be but I hope through the year it will be because from here on in meeting people is all the time happening to you you'll meet people who are smarter than you you'll meet people who aren't as smart as you you'll meet people who are good looking like you are I don't know if you are because you're hiding behind masks you'll meet people as good looking as me that's rarely but occasionally it's been known I think um, you, 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 you'll meet all kinds of people, but actually you'll only meet two people. You'll meet those who live their way and you'll meet people who live God's way. But that's actually in the end the difference. And if we can go back one PowerPoint, back one PowerPoint, can we go back, do you think? Yes, there we go, thank you. You see what it's like. It's a fundamental thing. It's not that they are going to be kind of more immoral than you. So you see them and you say, oh, well, you know, they're degenerate drunks lying in the gutter. <laughs> no, no, no. They're just people who choose to live their own life their own way, autonomously. 
in control of themselves. But it's a myth. And the COVID-19 has rattled them <laughs> because they're not in control. <laughs> And they can't be in control. Just a little disease, a little virus, can transform the whole of society. It was always a myth. And it's a myth that's a dangerous myth because it damages people's lives. Whereas God's way does not damage people's lives and is the truth. Why should you listen to me? Well, one of the reasons is because I am old. <laughs> and I've watched university generation after generation because I've been involved in university ministries since 1963. I've seen them come, I've seen them grow, I've seen them get old, I've seen them have children. And I can assure you what the Bible says is true. It actually works. As I've watched people damage themselves and their families, and as arch people flourish and produce magnificent children. At launch camps, where I see the outcome of your parents and what they've done for you. Now, our two interviews earlier, both came from Christian homes and the blessing, good on you, Rachel, for saying how good it was to grow up in a Christian home, because it is great blessing to do. But, you know, I knew her parents before they knew each other. So, oh no, your parents knew each other up in Armidale, didn't they? Yeah, no, I didn't know. But I met them at university when they first started. And there are people, you see, and you see the outcome of their lives. If you want to understand that, read Psalm 37 later on. Psalm 37 later on. The question, though, I want to put to you, because I want to put us all on the same footing right from the beginning, is... Which of these ways do you want to live? That's the question really, isn't it? And with it is the other question. It goes along the same thing. Which way are you now living? Oh, I know you've come to a Christian camp. I know your family thinks you're Christian. I know your friends think you're Christian and, and all the rest of it. But frankly, who runs you? Are you living for Jesus or are you living for the things you want to do in life? I mean, if I say living for you, it sounds selfish and self-centred, doesn't it? So just say you're living to do the things you want to do, which is selfish and self-centred, but don't worry about it. That's just part of the lies that the devil gives you, you see. Which, which are you and which do you want to be? And I want to encourage you, I want to tell you, turn back now. Now's the best time. You're going to start out this adult life, start out on the right basis. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for the new life that Jesus has won for us. How do you ask for it? Well, here's the prayer that we pray to become a Christian. But just as Jesus says in Mark's gospel, take up the cross, follow me, in Luke's gospel, he says, take up the cross daily and follow me. For the prayer that we pray to become a Christian is the prayer we pray as Christians. So I'm going to lead us in this prayer now. And I'll invite you to pray it along with me out loud as well, if you like. Yes, we'll do it that way. So you can join me in praying it out loud. But you know... If this is really the new prayer for you, if this is the change that you know for years from the youth fellowship you've been in, you should have made ages ago, and you're doing it now, then come morning tea, uh, tell, tell me about it. Oh, that, that embarrassing coming and tell me. Tell someone else here that I've just prayed that prayer for the first time, really. It's all you have to say, isn't it? so that we can encourage you further. The leaders are the easiest people to tell like that. But let's pray together, shall we? Dear God, I know that I'm not worthy to be accepted by you. I don't deserve your gift of eternal life. I am guilty of rebelling against you 
and ignoring you and I need forgiveness. Thank you for sending your son to die for me that I may be forgiven. Thank you that he rose from the dead to give me new life. Please forgive me and change me that I may live with Jesus as my ruler. Amen. If it is your prayer, you will be forgiven. How do I know you'll be forgiven? Jesus died so that you'll be forgiven. And if it is your prayer, you will be changed. How do I know you'll be changed? Because Jesus isn't dead. He's alive and rules the world. And if it's your prayer for the first time, make sure you tell someone over morning tea break, which we're going to have shortly after a few words from our sponsor.